Hello, uh, I think we can get started. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to the LAN Symposium. Uh, my name is Hua Zhou. I'm a faculty in biostatistics and the computational medicine here uh, at UCRA. Uh, it happens I'm also a former trainee of Ken. So uh, very excited to be here celebrating Ken's achievements. Um, as some of you know, uh, this annual event, we are uh, alternating the themes to acknowledge so, so many fields Ken has contributed to. And let me tell you, these numbers are even uh, four or five years old, and they are still uh, increasing crazily. So, uh, so uh, last October, it was statistical genetics. Today's theme is computational statistics. And we have a great lineup of six leading computational statisticians who are going to share their cutting edge research with us today. Uh, before that, let's have Ken say a couple words to us. I'll be very brief. I, I want to thank Jenny, Pat, and Eric Sobel for organizing this and applying for a grant to support it. Uh, I'll let them thank the staff who I'm sure put in quite a bit of work uh, getting this together. Uh, I agree with Wa. It's an all-star lineup. Uh, I've collaborated with five of six out of the six speakers and it's been such a privilege in my life to be surrounded by genius. Uh, these people are incredible. And I think their talks are going to be uh, perhaps somewhat abstract, but also very cutting edge. And if you learn their lessons, you will doubtless become a better computational statistician and machine learner. So uh, with, Having just said that, let me end and so we can get on to the speakers. Uh, I'm happy to talk to you during breaks uh, and thank you for coming. All right, thank you, Ken. Um, let's move to the first talk. Let me try to find the slides. <laughs> All right, so uh, our first speaker is uh, our own Mark Sucha. Uh, professor Mark Sucha is a professor in human genetics, biostatistics, and the computational medicine here at UCRA. Uh, I don't know for statisticians here, maybe Mark doesn't need an introduction. <laughs> uh, uh, it seems to me Mark has won uh, any possible awards a statistician can, can earn. Uh, including the COPS Award, which is the mo most prestigious award in statistics. And also, for sure, he's also one of the most cited researchers on this campus. Um, on, a, on a personal note, I always appreciate Mark for uh, bringing me back to UCLA. A couple of years ago, Mark was a search committee chair. He made a couple of calls, and I, I'm back here. So thank you, Mark. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, today, Mark, yeah. Today, Mark is going to share his recent work on scalable statistical inference in phylogenetics. Mark, please. Thank you yeah. for the introduction. Um, the ability to bring Hua back to UCLA campus is probably the, the largest success of, of my career. Uh, up to this point, for other... Awesome. For other individuals interested in coming back to UCLA at some point, let me know. <laughs> I work with uh, a large, very close group of collaborators, and over the last three years, they have painstakingly sleuthed out the home addresses of the first 168 reported human cases of what we now call SARS-CoV-2 infection or COVID-19. These first 168 infections were all in December 2019. Uh, before the rest of the world became aware of what was going on in Wuhan, China. And given the home addresses of those individuals, 
it's quite easy to see that the epicenter for these individuals lies almost directly on the Hunan seafood market. Um, from uh, in the top plot A, we have kind of the locations of the home addresses for these first individuals. And then the kind of panels B, C, and D do a kernel density estimate, sort of you assume that their, their locations are normally distributed, or perhaps some agent has been diffusing out from a, on a Brownian diffusion process. At the center of that you see in C is, is located right over that market. It's important to note that that market is known as a site for live animal trade, although by the time this became aware in the general public, all of those live animals had been removed from the market and none of them were able to be sampled to, to find out are they carrying SARS-CoV-2. And the sampling itself is, is also robust to just limiting it to the 140 or so individuals who did not have an epidemiological link to the market itself. So that, you know, they probably weren't the individuals that first became infected, but very quickly um, the disease was transmitted on. And this center or centroid of their location being over the market is very different than what you see if you look at everyone who had been infected by, say, the middle of January. By the middle of January, this had spread across most of the city, and the distribution that you see of people's home locations by that point follows the population distribution in the city itself, located uh, where the center of that is located several kilometers away from the market itself. So this provides very clear evidence that SARS-CoV-2 entered in the human population, probably somewhere around or in this um, live, uh, from the live animal trade within this market. And then, at least amongst the early cases, as you would expect, diffused out from that location. But it doesn't help us answer questions about how many transmissions might have there been from the animals that were being traded there into humans. And it doesn't give us very fine information about the time scale when these transmissions may have happened. So in order to learn about the number of transmissions, how many zoonotic events were there, and when these occurred, we need to turn to the genetic diversity of the virus itself. These same set of collaborators were very instrumental in pulling together the first approximately 800 genomes that were sampled and then sequenced before February 14th, 2020. Up on the screen, I've listed a kind of phylogenetic tree. You can't see any of the details in this tree up there. I don't want you to focus on any of the details. I'll describe what a phylogenetic tree is and then move on to some interesting statistics and math that we can do to have uh, to start to answer those questions. But there are two labels on this initial tree, kind of lineage A and lineage B. So if you look at the genetic diversity, it tends to cluster into two different lineages. And this is suggestive of two separate cross-species transmission events. If you do do a formal reconstruction of that tree, you can date the origin of these two different lineages. The first is lineage B, which seem to have arised in the last week of November or the first week in December of 2019. And then about two to three weeks later, you find the most recent common ancestor of lineage A, suggesting two different transmission events. But learning about these transmission events is actually quite difficult because the genetic interplay between SARS-CoV-2 and the human cells that it infects violates many of the standard biological modeling assumptions that we make in phylogenetic reconstruction. In particular, there are a couple of dark nodes or ancestors on that tree that are highlighted. And these are points where we see unusual changes in the genetic signature that we wouldn't expect under our standard models. In particular, there seems to be an increase of what biologists are calling cytosine to thymine or C to T reversions. And the reversion here is just saying there's a change back to what we think might have been the ancestral state. <laughs> 
And for those of us that work in genetics, you know, an important characteristic of changes to help differentiate is to help to differentiate these changes as either, you know, identity by state or identity by descent. If it's identity by descent, that implies this type of unusual change happened once, multiple copies were then made of it. And so that tells us about the, the ancestral relationships. Whereas identity by state might suggest that these types of unusual mutations are actually happening more commonly than we would expect, and they happened independently. So being able to model these unusual changes will help us do a better job in learning about the early history of SARS-CoV-2 and to get to sort of the punchline of the biological, res the biological results here, it's in it's the ability to flexibly include these types of model violations that actually allow us to reconstruct a fairly believable evolutionary history that demonstrates two at least two separate transmissions into humans. From a statistical or mathematical genetics perspective, the real key and what we're gonna focus on in most of this talk is a need for sort of more flexible, but yet still relatively parsimonious because these changes are very rare. We don't have a huge amount of information, but yet biologically informed substitution processes. So mathematical descriptions of how these changes occur as genetic sequences copy themselves um, over and over again, and are ultimately sampled for us to then reconstruct the evolutionary tree. So let me start with a very brief introduction to statistical phylogenetics. The underlying and perhaps most unobserved random variable that we'd like to learn about is often an unknown or unknown uh, rooted tree, which is, of course, it's a directed graph where the vertices might be the end tips of the tree, which are going to represent the genetic sequences that we've actually been able to obtain. And the internal node vertices represent unobserved ancestors or most recent common ancestors of those that we, uh, of, from those that we did observe. Um, along each of the edges in this graph is like some edge weight, which we generally think of as a branch length, or some measure of how many substitutions across the genome do we expect to see in that given time. And so running the inverse problem, assuming some generative process um, that describes how genetic sequences change along this unknown tree to give rise to our sequences. We can invert that and say, given the sequences, what does the tree look like? And what are the times of these most recent common ancestors? Uh, in order to do that, we need to specify what this generative process might look like. These ideas go back to sort of the mid 60s, um, with Tony Edwards and Luca cavalli schwarza who really sat down and thought about, you know, what are tractable statistical models for these types of comparative methods? We're comparing observations of things that are contemporaneous to learn about what their ancestors may have looked like. And the approach that's taken is to assume some memoryless or, or Markovian process is happening along each of these unknown branches, and they're scaled by the branch length. And that memoryless or Markovian process is then conditionally independent along these branches, given we assume we know what the ancestral sequences look like. Now, we don't have those ancestral sequences at all, so we'll have to integrate them out. The specific data generative process that you might use for aligned molecular sequences is a molecular alignment says I have a number of sequences. These sequences I've moved back and forth to make the following assumption that all of the characters within a sequence alignment column are homologous, meaning they shared a single common ancestor at that root of that evolutionary tree. And then along each of these branches, is acting a continuous time Markov chain. So this is a continuous process that emits in the nucleotide spa state space. So A, C, G, and T. Um, from the continuous time Markov process, there are a number of details here that aren't you know, particularly important for this talk, except for the fact that that process is characterized in terms of an infinitesimal generator, which tells us about what are the probabilities 
that changes might happen in really small amount of time. And I've listed those that infinitesimal generator or those rates, which we'll call Q, is made up of these elements lambda ij. So lambda ij from, for example, from A to T tells me about what's the rate at which I'm seeing mutations of going from A to T. So we're particularly interested in C to T transversions or reversions back to the state. So we might think there's some model violations in the infinitesimal generator, the infinitesimal rate that tells us about, for example, the C to T changes. Given the infinitesimal generator, we can exponentiate that matrix to arrive at the finite time transition probabilities, which are what we're going to use to construct our likelihood of the observed sequences. So these finite time transition probabilities, they're e to the qt, are the probability that I actually observed or assume I observe some specific state like an A at the end of a branch that was two, you know, 10 to the minus three expected substitutions where it started at a value T. So along each branch of the tree, we have these products of transition probabilities to write down the likelihood. If we assume we know what the sequence characteristic, what the sequences were at each of the internal and the, and the root nodes. And then we use a sum product algorithm or dynamic programming to integrate over the exponential number of sequence assignments that we could have gotten on each of the internal nodes. So the take home message on the likelihood likelihood is it's a conditionally independent continuous time Markov chain characterized in terms of some infinitesimal generator that has biologic meaning and, and we want to learn about. Uh, and we can arrive at the likelihood via a, a simple integration of everything that we didn't observe. And because it's a sum product algorithm, we can do that in computational order that scales linearly with the number of tips. So you can start thinking about doing this for tens, hundreds, thousands, millions of, of possible sequences, even though there is an exponential sum going on. But I wanna focus particularly on this infinitesimal generator and some modeling extensions that we might want to make in order to accommodate these special mutations that are happening in SARS-CoV-2. So what I'm, what I'm going to propose is one starts with a standard continuous time Markov chain that's used in phylogenetics. And I've listed a couple of these down at the bottom. A very standard model is something called the Hashigawa, Kishino, and Yanu model. And that model is parameterized in terms of a transition transversion rate ratio, which describes the relative rates at which purines change to other purines, pyrimidines change to other pyrimidines, and a much slower rate in which case one goes back and forth between these different classes of nucleotides and some stationary distribution. And of course, the state space for that continuous time Markov chain over nucleotides is four. There are four nucleotides that we see at each of these alignment sites. But one also uses continuous time Markov chains for much larger state space problems. And that's where the real computational problems come in. Instead of looking at individual alignment sites, you might be looking at protein coding regions and want to set up your generator over the codon state space where you have somewhere between 61 to 64 possible outcomes, depending on the type of organism itself. Or instead of modeling um, observed sequences at the tips of the tree, we might be bringing in a whole lot of meta information, like the country in which a genetic sequence was sampled from. And we want to learn both about the underlying evolutionary history and the process in which it moved from country to country under an idea called phylogeography. And there's, you know, now a, a vast body of research on phylogeographic generalized linear models. But the point to keep home is these state spaces can now be up in the order of you know, hundreds. Um, so let's start with a, a standard model that's biologically informed like HKY. And to that standard model on the log scale, let's add a random effect. Doesn't seem very complicated, right? We have a four by four matrix with four choose two or 12 uh, entries in it, each of those four choose two entries now has an additional random effect. But most of those effects are going to be very poorly informed by the data itself. The biological model does a pretty good job of, of picking up how this mutation process happens. And 
when S is really large, you know, 100 choose two is extraordinarily large random effects, we want to shrink those random effects so that unless the data says otherwise, that effect is going to be very close to zero and we can ignore it so we can have the most efficient estimate possible. So on each of these S choose two random effects, let's add something called a Bayesian bridge, which is a, 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 a relatively modern Bayesian approach to regularization problems that most of you are very familiar with. Um, the Bayesian bridge itself, you know, it, it provides a very convenient form for Bayesian regular, uh, regularization. It has two hyperparameters that we either need to learn about or assume. One is called the exponent and the other is the global scale. For standard you know, L1 regularization, like your penalty might be you know, lambda, the L1 norm. And so here the global scale is equivalent to that lambda. But the exponential gives us a whole family of different distributions. When the exponential is two, this is really just a normal model. I'm saying I have normal random effects. When the exponential is one, I have double Laplacian random effects. So this really is the Bayesian equivalent of the L1 regularization. Um, what might be even more useful is considering regularization where alpha is much smaller than one, say one quarter. And you can see that as alpha gets smaller, there's more and more mass peaked right near zero, saying that if the data don't tell me Otherwise, this random effect is, is basically zero, and the shoulders tend to get thicker and thicker and uh, sort of heavier and heavier and heavier, which means if it's non-zero, I'm imparting less and less bias into that estimate through this. Um, unfortunately for the Bayesian bridge, there's no good closed form for the probability distribution function, but we can do some additional data augmentation, like let's assume we know something called a local scale. So this is a scale parameter that affects only one of the random variables. So there's already S choose two of these, in which case you can write the random effect distribution is normally distributed with the product of the local and the global scale. In some work that I don't have time to talk about with a former postdoc, um, Aki Nishimura, um, we've, we've done a, a fairly comprehensive view of Bayesian bridges for a number of different generalized linear model types approaches, and have very recently been able to show some geometric ergodicity, which means that most standard Bayesian samplers will successfully sample from, um, from this model, even when the data are very poorly informative. So what's the trouble? This seems very straightforward. Um, I have a standard model, a continuous time Markov chain. I add some random effects onto it. Well, the real challenge is we now have, you know, S choose two additional unknown parameters that are very poorly informed by the data that we need to learn about. These parameters are not only weakly identified, you know, they're, they're prop, you know, given any Given many data sets, they are not identifiable in the likelihood. Um, even given the posterior, they're still going to be very weakly identifiable. And even if they are identifiable, they're all going to be highly correlated with each other, right? Since these are rates, I can imagine I can increase them all, all of the rates, and decrease the size of the tree a little bit, and I'm still going to get the same, the same likelihood. So the solution that we're going to use, and that's going to motivate some of the very simple applied math that I'll go through, is we're going to use Hamiltonian Monte Carlo to sample these random effects, which is which is not necessarily new in the Bayesian community, but it certainly is in the in the phylogenetics community. A very brief introduction of Hamiltonian Monte Carlo is the idea is we're going to start with a parameter space say these are the random effects that we wanna learn about. And we're gonna do some additional data augmentation. And that data augmentation is gonna be with some auxiliary Gaussian variables, P, that we're gonna think of as momentum, right? They have no counter place in the likelihood itself. They're simply added for the convenience of this transition kernel that we're gonna to use to build a Markov chain. And then given both the parameters that we want to learn about and the mo momentum, we can construct, you know, Hamilton's energy function, which basically says, you know, the Hamiltonian, which is a function of these parameters indexed by some imaginary time. We're going to think about some dynamics. This isn't evolutionary time, right? This is just some made up time in, in building this sampler is going to be proportional to, you know, kind of the log posterior, 
So that's the posterior of our model, right? Plus the, the, the log density for the momentum where we assume that they're, they're Gaussian with some variance covariance matrix, which I've just written as M here, which is, which is rather arbitrary. And then we're going to build a Markov chain, not based on the standard Metropolis Hastings sort of a random walk proposals, but our proposals are going to come from integrating Hamilton's equation or following the path of least action of this dynamical system. And under Hamilton's equations, the, the dynamics um, cover a number of different properties. Um, those that we want to pay attention to are the dynamics are reversible. So if I started with negative the momentum, I would just walk back the same path that, that I started with. They're, they're volume preserving, so they don't expand or contract space, which is useful when you want to do change of variables. So you don't have to worry about the Jacobian in there at all. Um, and the dynamics themselves are, are energy conserving, but they don't have to be. As a matter of fact, most HMC that's used in Bayesian phylogenetics um, is solved, via, the Hamilton's equations is solved via numerical integration, which introduces discretization of time error, which violates the energy conservation. But we don't even have to actually use the true Hamilton dy dy dynamic. We could use an approximation to it that as long as it's volume preserving and reversible, we're going to be okay because we'll do an accept reject step at the all, at, at at the end. So ultimately, we need to integrate either the real dynamic or an approximation to the dynamic. So to summarize, sort of that introduction to HMC, it actually scales really well in high dimensions. There was a plot on the other page going through this banana distribution, and because we have dynamics that go through the path of least action, you can take very large steps or very large movement in a single step of your Markov chain. And it does this because we're using curvature information. We can handle that high correlation. Of course, that curvature information is coming from the part I skipped over. When we numerically integrate, we need to be evaluating the gradient of the log density. Uh, we can also make the dynamic a little on better footing with sort of preconditioning the amount of momentum that we're putting in by picking M. The downside is we now, to solve this problem, need to do many, many evaluations of the gradient of the data log likelihood with respect to each of our S choose two random variables. So the real problem on a you know, massive genome scale is we have to compute this gradient fast and accurately, or at least relatively accurately. So let me step back and provide a little more detail on the phylogenetic likelihood so we can get a handle on what this gradient is going to look like. We want the probability of observing one of those alignment sites across all, in this case, 800 uh, genomes that we have. So that's the probability of that colored bar. You know, given we currently are evaluating this on a specific tree and a specific infinitesimal generator. So that's the graph of like A, G, C, and T going there. It turns out you can write this likelihood as a number uh, as the inner product of two partial likelihood vectors. So in dynamic programming, in order to compute the likelihood, we do a post-order traversal of the tree from the tips, uh, from the tips to the top. And each of these, each of the steps of this traversal just looks at my two children and asks, can I compute the probability of the sequences that I observe just below me? given all possible states that I can be. So that's called the post-order likelihood vector. And you get this for each of the vectors. You can then come back down the tree, which hasn't been done much in phylogenetics, and get something called the pre-order partial likelihood, which is what's the probability of all the data that is not below me on the rest of the tree? So you can imagine if I have the post order, everything below me, and the pre order, everything not below me, I take an inner product of those two terms that tells me about the whole bit of the joint data that I'm interested in, right? So we can write the likelihood as the post order vectors, this is what you normally get from pruning up a tree, times the trans, times the pre order vector, which I can rewrite as 
the transition probabilities on the specific branch and all the data um, from my parent to the rest of the tree. What's important to keep in mind is both these pre and post order vectors, they're readily available with a single post order traversal and then pre order traversal. So they're available in order n, not bad. But what we need to find out how the transitions are changing on each of those branches is we need the derivative of the matrix exponential with respect to each of its individual rates, right? If I want the derivative with respect to one of the rates, lambda sub i, I can just add up over each of the branches, right? The pre-order multiplication is sort of left multiplication by the post order, right multiplication by the pre order times the differential of what's going on in that particular branch. Now, naively computing that is order n s to the fifth. And the reason that comes in is the pre and post order traversal, order n, we have s squared parameters with which we need to take that derivative. And naively taking that derivative with most of the approaches that are at least used in statistics is order s cubed. So we got something s to the fifth, which might not seem so bad for a nucleotide state space, but it's certainly not going to work for codons or phylogeography. So I want to draw your attention to uh, a, a, a really informative both review um, and derivation of several different ways of computing the derivative of the matrix exponential published in 1995. Um, and this review traces back the early origins of computing matrix uh, uh, differentials. And the earliest reference I can find actually comes from Richard Feynman in his discussion of quantum electrodynamics. And Feynman writes out this matrix differential in terms of an integral representation. So it's the, the convolution of the evolution of the Markov process from time zero to some arbitrary point along the branch, and then multiplied by the direction of the derivative we want to take. So how much that action is going in the direction we want to take, and then the completion of the evolution from that intermediate point to the end of the branch. And of course, if you want the differential, you need to average over all possible intermediate points on there. Um, what's nice about the, the place by Nafeld and, and Havel is, is they go a whole lot further and they use this expression to derive additional both spectral series and some exact representations of the, the, deriv of the, the derivative of the matrix exponential. Its canonical form in statistical inference go, was really popularized and has actually become sort of almost religious lore. Like, the, you know, all reviewer comments I've ever seen all point back to the Cab Fleisch and Lawless paper in 1985, um, who lay out a lot of fundamental work with continuous time Markov chains. Um, and the approach that they've taken is the, the S cubed approach. So you can take an, an augmented matrix Z, which has both the infinitesimal generator Q in its diagonals. And then in its upper left-hand corner, we can put in the indicator matrix, which just has a single one in the single rate lambda IJ that we're interested in taking the derivative for. And then if you write out the, um, at least the power series representation of the matrix exponential of Z, you'll see that in the upper left diagonal of that expansion, you have the derivative with respect to one of the elements. Well, that's helpful if you wanna take the derivative with respect to one of the elements, but I wanna do this for all of the elements and they're S squared of them, right? So matrix diagonalization is S cubed times S squared is S to the fifth. This is really not gonna fly very well. So I'd like to propose a very modest approximation, and then we'll ask how this approximation does uh, in terms of theory and in practice. So Nafeld and Havel also provide a power series representation of the matrix exponential. And so that power series representation expresses it as a series, as a, as, as a power series in terms of the length of the branch, 
times this object called the matrix commuter power. And so the matrix commuter power is defined recursively based on the matrix commutator. And you can think about it intuitively as a way of representing all possible orderings in which each of the single changes from state to state might have happened along the branch. And obviously it's continuous time. So there are an infinite possible orderings of different types of events that could have happened on that branch. But what happens if we just think about taking a first order approximation to this power series in T, right? We're basically just setting our sum X to zero. Then we actually get a fairly simple representation for the approximation of the matrix derivative, right? The matrix derivative with respect to one of the elements is the transition probability along that branch pointing in the direction in which we're interested in, in calculating this derivative. So is a first order Taylor expansion and truncating at the first order, is this really reasonable? Well, in many phylogenetics, I think the answer is yes, because T, the length of a branch, is generally parameterized in terms of the expected number of substitutions in any given time. And genomes evolve really slowly, right? These branches for the, for the SARS-CoV-2 tree are on the order of days or weeks, and you have 10 to the minus six expected substitutions per site in that amount of time that's pretty close to zero. You know, T squared is probably, 10 to the minus 12, is probably not very important. So let's take that very simple approximation and plug it into the different, the, the derivative that we're interested in calculating and figure out what is the work that we now need to do to, to ask, did we save ourselves anything in this? And it turns out we actually have saved ourselves quite a bit, right? We want the derivative with respect to one of the elements. It's kind of the weighted inner product of the pre and post order likelihood vectors. We can put in the first, this is the first order expansion, right? We can take T out because it's a scalar. We've already computed what's the transition probability along that branch, right? So if I then group all of these entries, so I don't just want it for one variable, I want it for all S squared variables into some matrix, right? I can write that matrix that I wish to calculate over a single branch really as the weighted outer product right here of a whole bunch of values that I've already computed in computing the likelihood, right? So it's, it's the outer product of the pre and post order. So that gives me the, instead of a value, the likelihood, it gives me the, the, the entries into each of these S matrices. Um, and then they're scaled by the branch lane. Now, ideally, if we want to use this approximate gradient for doing optimization, uh, we'd like some sort of error bounds. Like, you know, how far off the truth are we going to be? And if you're doing optimization, you probably want some error on the angle between the true gradient and this approximate gradient. Like, you know, if I could say it's like less than 90 degrees, then I'm pretty sure I'm walking in the right direction. We haven't very gotten very far on getting a good bound or a useful bound yet on the angle, but I will present some bound results. This computational work is now just ns squared. Right, that's three orders of magnitude better than, than what we had before. And it's certainly been implemented already in a bunch of use, in, in several use, uh, pieces of phylogenetic software so that we can use it um, now for the SARS-CoV-2 problems. Um, we even have a nice GPU version of this, but that's the topic of, uh, of our next talk. So I'll, I'll leave that for the next talk. Let's start with some empirical evidence. You know, does this approximate gradient help us uh, to, you know, to, to, to approach a maximum a posteriori estimation problem, right? So instead of looking at nucleotides, let's turn ourselves to a, a small example where our state space for our continuous time Markov chain are amino acids. So S is 20. Um, there's a fair bit of ambiguity about the early ordering amongst animals. Um, and kind of what came branched off first uh, in terms of was it the sponges or the comb jellies? And then much later came animals that we're a little more familiar with. Um, and what are the effects that you would have um, by 
generalizing the current models that we have for amino acids. So our current models for amino acids are almost all empirically derived. So there's no free parameters to estimate, um, and there's not much faith in the evolutionary biology community that they actually do a good job of, of mapping what the evolutionary process looks like all the way back across the whole tree of the metazoa. So we're gonna start with one of these empirical models and add a large number of random effects to ask, do the data differentiate? And in the first plot, I plotted sort of an, an X versus Y plot. Everything should line up on the diagonal of the estimates that one gets using our approximation versus what you would get using a first or a sort of a, a central difference on the likelihood approximation. It turns out that this problem is too large to even use the kind of Cabflish and Fleisch S to the fifth approach. It just takes way too, takes way too long, but you know, a, a central differences are fine. And so the approximation does a great job of, reco of, of recovering kind of our estimate of the, mer of the numerical derivative. Um, the random effects themselves, most of them as we would expect are shrunk very close to zero, but there is some evidence that there are a, a handful of random effects that are actually important for describing how these amino acid changes. But what's more important is the optimization approach that we took was, you know, kind of a standard first order optimization, um, you know, a limited memory VFGS, I'm sure there are better. But if you look at kind of the run times, it was one second for the central differences versus like two times 10 to the hundredth seconds for the approximate, right? So you're getting the same answer 50 times faster. I said I'd... I'd mention a little bit about the work that we've been doing in terms of getting some error bounds um, on this approximation. So again, using the power series expansion, we can write one of these derivatives as this infinitesimal sum where I've pulled out our approximation and left the rest of the sum. And so I've written our approximation as the summit that we're going to use and the remainder. And so we've started doing some work on looking at what are some bounds that we can put on the absolute and the relative size of that remainder to ask, um, you know, are we doing a good job? And the answer is no, these, well, these bounds are huge. So in practice, they're probably not very useful. Um, so we'd like to do much better. Uh, but, you know, in terms of the relative, the absolute bound for R, yeah, it still goes as, you know, E to the 2T, right? So T goes down to zero. So that's still a really big number. So what we found in practice is the error was much smaller. We got the same maximum, uh, but we don't have a very tight bound. Uh, we're certainly working on that. And of course, the relative bound itself is, is not terribly useful at all. It has a one over T term in it. So it, you know, it blows up. The, this, this bound for both T small and, and T big. Um, but for those of you that are interested, um, and this was good learning from me that I didn't do, but I'll give credit at the end for who was doing this, on, on getting bounds of this uh, commu of commutator power series. Um, this is you know, multiple applications of triangle inequalities, which you have on matrix norms. And there's a nice uh, inequality of the bound for the matrix commutator um, in terms of the product of the two matrices. And then it, it blows up in terms of t, uh, two to the n, which is really where this exponential is coming from. So more work is needed on showing that uh, in which conditions this is a good approach. In our hands, it seems to be fine. Let's finally turn our attention back to the early origins of SARS-CoV-2 and ask how do we do in capturing the evolutionary process and how does that process differ from kind of the standard models that, uh, that, that, that currently exist. So again, we're going to reconstruct the evolutionary history from about 800 near full length genomes. These were all of the known genomes up until the middle of February. And in this plot, we're going to look at the normalized rate. So these are the, the lambda ijs of going back and forth between the four different states. So for example, going from A to C in infinitesimal time, or going from C to T, which is the one that we really want to, that we really want to analyze. Um, and we're going to make a comparison between two different estimates. So one is, you know, sort of the tried and true Hashigawa, Casino, and Yanu model, which is used in phylogenetics, plus the random effects. 
And we're going to compare that to sort of the, the, the general time reversible. This is the most flexible general time reversible model that you could use in these, in these data. And what you see is there is a substantial difference in the estimates that we get given the data in the rates of the C to T trans uh, reversions um, between these two models. We can ask, you know, what's the probability of the nested model? What's the probability of, what's the relative probability of the random effects model versus the general time reversible? And they're astronomically large saying that the, the data really do support these random effects. And we do a much better job of, of capturing the difference in this evolutionary history. So there is nice strong evidence for increased C to T substitutions that the GTR model really fails to capture. And it's because of this model extension that we're able to put the appropriate amount of evidence on the observation that there are a number of these reversions that are happening and really they're most likely just uh, identity by state. This, this substitution happens much more commonly than we, thought be, than we thought before. And that helps us pull apart these two traits and get uh, these two, two lineages and ascribe some reasonable times to, uh, uh, to their transmission into humans. I'm going to finish briefly by not only talking about how we do a better job of estimating the biological process, but we can also do it a whole lot more efficient, computationally efficiently. Uh, and the way that we're going to look at that is looking at trace plot comparisons. So if you're doing Bayesian inference, one approach that you'll take is numerical integration using Markov chain Monte Carlo. And so you'll simulate a Markov chain and you want the correlation for this Markov chain to be as small as possible or each step to explore as, as much of the space as, as possible. Um, the example that we're gonna look at is gonna be sampling a, a, a phylogeographic problem um, involving Ebola. So it's a 56 space problem. And we're going to compare the, the how well HMC is working with this approximate gradient, because it just runs way too slowly without it, uh, versus a standard random walk Metropolis Hastings approach. And so here is a, a trace plot that those of you who fit um, uh, shrinkage based random effects models will immediately look at and say, yeah, it looks like the gold is exploring that model very efficiently. This is like 6,000 steps and it bounces back and forth. And there are parts where it gets shrunk to zero and parts where it explores the tail. And so HMC is doing a pretty good job. The blue bar that doesn't look like it's moving at all is what you get when you try the most auto adapted Metropolis Hastings random walk sampler. Like it's going nowhere. And to get an idea that it's going nowhere is this over here on the right is the exact same trace plot with a very different scale on the Y axis. And you can see the random walk Metropolis Hastings is doing what it should be doing, but it's doing it really inefficiently. There's huge autocorrelation in there. Uh, it's important to remember that regularization can also result in, in vastly different scales of posterior support across the random effects. Right? Most of those random effects get shrunk to zero. And so their posterior support is what we're seeing here, you know, 10 to the minus 14. Whereas the random effects that are non-zero have some finite value. And so you need a sampler that can uh, naturally adjust for moving for large amounts of momentum in the space where you need to make bigger jumps and less momentum in the spaces where you need to make it smaller jumps. What I haven't talked about here are some nice approaches you can take to preconditioning the HMC to for Bayesian bridge type prior densities that, that, really in, that really improve even further than this, sort of mixing across all of these dimensions. So let me finish up with a very quick summary. And that is, you know, gradient-based inference for continuous time Markov chains finally appears effective. Before this was an order N S to the fifth proposition. And it was almost never done for continuous time Markov chains. Uh, the Lawless paper is great, but it's from 85 and it still doesn't have as many citations as such a wonderful paper should have. Um, because it turns out it's not terribly practical. But how did we make that practical, at least for these continuous time Markov chains, is we proposed a very simple, naive approximation to that gradient. And for some cases where T is small, that approximation is very good. In phylogenetics, T is generally very small. 
What does this enable? Well, it enables, at least in phylogenetics, us to provide a very flexible random effects model, which wasn't possible before. And the random effects help to capture sort of important biological effects. And so the example that we used here with SARS-CoV-2, and it was these overabundance of C to T reversions and putting the appropriate weight on them. Ultimately, that helped increase our support for the hypothesis of multiple zoonotic spillovers, um, first with lineage B and then with lineage A, most likely coming in the Hunan seafood market. These approximate gradients are extraordinarily fast on trees. As I mentioned, they're still order N with the size of the tree itself um, and typically doable for, for many sizes of S. Um, there aren't too many lingering theoretical issues about using these approximate gradients inside of HMC. Uh, you know, the approximate gradient itself still provides a reversible transition kernel. If you have the negative momentum, you still back end up at the place that you started. And there's still volume preserve, preserving, so we don't have to worry about ratios of densities. But we have some very questionable findings and some very little answers about their use for strict optimization. And a lot of that is going to come down to, you know, tighter, tighter more useful bounds on the error. And in particular, are we even moving in the right direction in the first place? No work is ever done in a vacuum. And unfortunately, these days, I don't get to do any work at all. Um, almost everything that I've presented, with some small exception, is the brainchild of an amazing postdoc in my group, uh, Andy McGee. Uh, for those of you from other universities, Andy will soon be on the job market. And if you're looking for someone great in computational statistics the at the intersection of mathematical biology, which I think I've come to the right audience, um, this is a, an individual to keep an eye out for. Uh, Andy and I are also working with Andrew Holbrook, who's in the back of the room, who has been providing some, some wonderful guidance and a whole lot of work on providing nice bounds on the approximation that we're using, that we're using here. I also need to mention uh, Jiang Zhang, who's in the Department of Mathematics at Tulane University, and uh, long-term collaborator Eric Matson from the Hutch. Uh, we will have a manuscript very soon. Is Andy here? I'm going to give him the evil eye uh, <laughs> for people who are interested. So thank you for your attention. Ken, of course, gets the first question. I have one technical comment. Yes. Could you go back to the Feynman formula? Yeah. So what you're using, you're setting B equal to I here. Yeah. So you can compute, and what you're assuming is that B then commutes with one of those two exponentials. No, it, it, it when, when it does commute. So when when Q when when Q commutes with when the differential of Q commutes with Q, then there's a much easier expression. Well, what I'm saying is yeah. you can commute B across the first or the second exponential, and you should divide the interval in half, yeah. and we will get a better approximation. Yes, 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 yes. So, so there are uh, a number of different representations that. Uh, uh, um, that that we are exploring, uh, this is one of them, and it should give a, it should give a more act that should give a more accurate approximation. Um, my justification here is a dirty little secret, <laughs> and the dirty little secret for this one is when your differential and Q do commute, like for example, you want to take the derivative with respect to T then there's a very simple solution for what the matrix differential is. Um, and we've been using that for taking the derivative with respect to T in the software for a long time. So my real motivation for this specific approximation was, is can I find an approximation where the software, with, that the software currently implements? Um, and, and this happens to be that one, but there are, there are, uh, there are perhaps better, um, um, approximations out there, and you mentioned one, which is you can go in one direction or the other, um, but they're going to require a, re, a, a retooling. So we want to get some bounds to see are the, you know, are the errors, how much smaller are the errors? 
applied in the interval context in such a serious context? I don't know the answer to that question, and that's very thought provoking. There you have it. So, so the yeah. So the question is: so here, here, here's a series representation, um, uh, and you can get bounds in series representation. Or there are integral and also some other spectral representations as 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 well that you could use uh, to pull out to 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 bound the error. Um, and my expert Andrew uh, says the in this case the inter, uh, the integral representation would perhaps be more convenient, which means we could probably get a better bound um, for for getting rid of one of those uh, moving out one of those exponentials. Yeah, awesome. Thank you. I have a question here. Sure. The, the, the Bayesian for each trial sounds very interesting. I wonder, is this for a, a trial, uh, how many finishing points also do you have this way? Like, do you get it to that zero? So, so uh, you know, under the posterior, nothing, you know, the probability that it's zero is, is zero, zero, right? Because, I mean, your support is uh, continuous. Uh, but it is often used for model selection. It then begs the question, you need to set some threshold for what are you calling not in the model or not? And that's that's a very active area of research. I think McKellie is. McKellie, do you want to add anything to doing model selection with a shrinkage prior? Yeah. Yeah. OK. Yeah, it's done. You just pick it, you know, I, as long as, you know, it's less than, I don't know, less than 0.1, I'm, I'm going to call it zero, then. You go with it. Yeah. 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 All right. uh, first of all, awesome talk. Uh, one slide before Ken's question. So the one where you introduced the pre and post order. Yeah. So mm -hmm. I, I didn't catch the second one here. So you have the pre order likelihood back here. Then you have a pre pre order. What, what was? Yeah. So it depends on how you define the pre order okay. likelihood. Um, you know, I can compute the likelihood of all of my data not below me, all the way down to me, which is what we're currently doing just to save memory. Okay. Or I can compute the likelihood of all the data not below me all the way up to my parent times what's going on along this branch. And, and here we're interested in focusing what's going on along this branch. So I've just factored it out. Yeah. And then would you even get from the first to second is just like the master table? Yeah, I start here, yeah, yeah. I evolve. And then yeah. that's you know, and that's yeah. the the rest of it is the the, the probability statement. Cool. And then you feel like all of these gradients are going into HMC. So even though you're like trying to figure out more about the error bound, at the end of the day, you're correcting yeah. some kind of stuff. So your posterior is sad. Yeah, yeah. No, the posterior is totally fine. Yeah, awesome. uh, I mean, the 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 bounding error just will help you decide how efficient oh, you're right. you're moving. But the posterior is fine. Yeah. Uh, if you want to use this for optimization. Uh, it seems to work really well, but that's all I can provide right now. Thank you very much for your time.